start. Thank you all for coming to uh, session two, the long form essay. Um, what I want to do is tell you very little bit about what we do in this class. I'm going to introduce our players. And I will uh, ask them to read their papers. And then what I'd like to do is after everyone reads, I think we'll go to questions from the audience. So take notes if you have questions. But I'm also going to ask folks to talk a little bit about their process in writing the papers. So here we go. Um, this is English 33101, the long form essay. And what we do in this class is we've taken more than a few steps beyond the idea of the essay as the five paragraph prison, the thing that everybody wrote in high school, the thing that we think of academically, which is the thesis statement, the supporting statements, the summary statement. So what we do in a long form literary essay is we've considered it as a nonfiction exploration that's intimate toward the self, yet interrogative of the world. So this semester, so far, so far, we have examined the intellectual and literary craft of masters like uh, Montaigne, Michel de Montaigne, Charles Lamb, Virginia Woolf, as well as contemporary authors like John Jeremiah Sullivan, Leo Kapura, John D. Agata, um, and so forth. We've also taken a look at how content providers like Long Read, Long Reads with a byliner, or This American Life as a radio essay program, or video essays. Um, have adapted this, anti this ancient form into the modern world. Um, so, what I'd like to do is introduce five students from this class and turn it over to y'all. Turn it over to y'all. We have got Elizabeth Byron. Oh, it's out of order from the program. We have got Rachel Millens. We've got Chelsea Rodriguez. We've got Alex Vallon. And we've got Paige Oliver. <laughs> so, I think what I'd like to do is, uh, Elizabeth, you want to start us off? Um, my essay is Bad Artist, Good Art. Um, artists get to do a lot of stuff. They get to end books with passages with yes, and his heart was going like mad, and I said, yes, I will, yes. And they get to send giant inflated yellow ducks bobbing around the world. They get to pee on a crucifix. Hell, they probably get to pee in the shower. And they get to do generally eccentric things because they have the value of their art to vouch for them. They paint ballerinas and compose Ride of the Valkyries and write The Wasteland. They are entitled to racist and anti-Semitic remarks. They create modern art and chronicle Don Juan and shoot elephants as they write about vast seas and old men. They get to be misogynists and enjoy the premium membership of the Master Lust Monsters Club. They get to paint starry nights and write about the halos and giggle lamps of life. They get to kill themselves, and we say it's something out of the ordinary, that it's romantically tragic. They get to become martyrs for their art, for transgressing the line between personal and social morality. They get to do a lot of stuff, and we let them. So can bad people make good art? Well, yes, they can, and they have, and they will continue to. But what makes us allow it? What makes us see people generally regarded as bad people, the social failures and moral, morally dubious, as offering something of value to us? Gregory Hemingway, Hemingway once wrote to his father and asked, which do you think is the most important, you, your self-centered shit, the stories, or the people? Where is the line drawn between the artist and the person? The value of their art often acts as recompense for the collateral damage of their lives. It makes it easy to excuse them. Let's assume art is good because it's valuable. What makes it valuable? The price of the paint, the skill of the pen, or is it something more subjective, like knowing the name and the fame behind it? A man once went into the DC subway and performed six box, box pieces for violin. He got $32 in tips. The violin he played was worth $3.2 million. His concert days before had sold out for an average of $100 a seat. Good art is good because everyone says so, or at least all the important people agreed it was to be lauded. And so it was, and so everyone else accepted it. Young once said that James Joyce and his daughter Luc Lucia were in a schizophrenic river, but he was diving and she was falling. To be clear, this is not a game of who was worse. It is the shoots and ladders of artist morality and public ex acceptance. Art exists because people want to enjoy it, and the artist exists because they want people to enjoy the pieces of them that they can break off and offer. Their art becomes their medium for love, and if their message, whatever it may be, is accepted and the public loves it, then they in turn love the artist for making it. Love allows for all sorts of margins of error. No one wants to acknowledge the worst in someone they love unless it's unavoidable. We all think that our love is enough to make, person, to make people worth our time, to make them stay, to make them better, to make them valuable. It is in human nature to love, and to love is both a choice and a surrender. You choose to love, and you choose to surrender yourself to this love, and thus the margins of allowance this love engenders. You choose to look at art, and you choose to surrender yourself to the love of that art, and this surrender sometimes is blind of good judgment or moral failings. 
Art exists to please, and so does the artist, but on different level, though equal. Wolf is not red to reveal why she filled her pockets full of stones and waited until her feet touched the bottom of the river. She is red because her words, her art, is beautiful and poignant and speaks to something within <coughs> ourselves that we often ignore. The love of art is transcendent because you can love the work without knowing anything about the artist, and it makes for a good excuse when an artist themselves is called into question. What's your favorite Woody Allen movie? Why do we love what we love? It speaks to us, resonating like rocks knocking down into a stony pit. It tells us that everything will be all right because you love this thing and it is yours and not anyone else's and in this moment you love it so dearly. Art is something that is loved so completely in the moment that it does not allow for error and the artist doesn't believe that it can either for if it is well accepted, how can it be bad? Love is at its core acceptance and to be loved or to love something means that you accept it as what it is or what it represents. The connotation of love is goodness. People tend to love what they think is good, art included. Note the way the eyes light up when you mention a favorite artist. Observe the smile widening when a familiar name is dropped into the conversation like a buoy, anchoring the innocuous chatter to something sturdier. The golems of, golems of love roam everywhere, ready to snatch up the next victim with a luckily uttered word, for that's what love must be, a golem, formless until it's given shape and sent to wander a lonely heart. Everyone wants to be loved, and everything has someone to love, and everyone has someone to love. Art happens to be a vicious motivator of love, because it's viciously present and can be viciously appreciated. Back to the artists and their syllogisms. The art is good because it is loved. It is still good when the is it still good when the artists are no longer loved? Then again comes the separation between artists and art. Does love make us bypass their moral faults, or is it something else? Is there a worldly limit to where the golem can roam away with our love before it can't get any farther, or drops it to the ground from the sheer burden? Good artists can be bad people. Philandering Picasso, Les Monster Byron, and Grand Aryan Wagner. What is their, why does their art excuse them? Because it is love, and love is beget from acceptance. We all agree that to love their art, we must accept the artists in whatever great or terrible form they take. Their art is a reflection of themselves, or what they want us to see, and thus we love what we are presented with, perhaps not what is actually there, or what lies beneath. It is human nature to find love where it appears, and art is a highly conductive medium to generate love because, in a sense, art is love. Art is the neon sign of expression and easy to connect to and by default accept. Artists, then, are creating love when they create their masterpieces, for the love of the thing endures through time, though their reputation may not. After, ask yourself about your favorite work of art and then ask what you know about its creator. Thank you, Elizabeth. Rachel Mills. Uh, on Human Nature and Society. Fifteen minutes before I leave for work, and now is when I decide to write my paper. I sit in my dorm alone, with music playing to drown, this, to drown any other sound. Why did I wait until the last minute to do my homework? Dorm life is okay. My neighbors are friends with each other, and my roommate is just someone I talk to when I'm trying to avoid my homework. Jealousy. Why do my neighbors get to be friends and I awkwardly, and I get to awkwardly share a room with a stranger? It seems to be a habit among college students to procrastinate. My roommate and neighbors openly and quickly admit that 90% that of their homework is done the night before it's due. At least we have that in common. I still feel like an outsider on campus. To, that, to think that, as habitually procrastinating college students, I could use this com commonality to make friends quickly and easily. I should be able to walk down to the students and yell, my homework is due in less than 24 hours and I haven't even started it yet. Who else is in the same boat? Ta-da, friends. Life is never that simple. People, people are picky. I'm picky. I leave for work at the final minute. I'm on time, but if I had stopped for anything, I would have been late. Babysitting is easy, and children are interesting. We went to the park to watch. We went to the park and to watch how children, whether they are four years old or ten years old, seem to know where to go and how to how to play, how to play and make friends quickly and easily. Children make life seem so simple. In reality, it is. Adults complicate things. I should have worked on my paper sooner. I think I do my best running when I'm under pressure. I don't really give myself time to write leisurely anyway, especially if it's homework. I was able to spend Valentine's Day and all weekend with my boyfriend. I haven't seen him since he left the UJ in January, and our time spent together was even more enjoyable than it usually was when we were able to spend time, whenever, when we were able to spend every day together. I cried when he left him, when he had to leave on Sunday, but I was relieved to let him go. I enjoy being able to miss the ones I love. It makes our time together even better. On campus, I still feel like a stranger. Given we have two snow, Given we've had two snowstorms within three weeks and classes were canceled for both storms, I haven't had much time to get to know anyone on campus. Every time it snowed, I packed my stuff and went home. Maybe if I had stayed on campus, I would have, had, I would have been forced to work with, work with other people stuck on campus without a car in order to survive snowpocalypse. Apocalyptic scenarios always give reason for people to come together. 
hopefully Georgia will ice over again and I can stay on campus and make friends. I wish this essay had to, had to be shorter than 1,200 words. Not saying that I can't write a 1,200 word essay, but it, would be, but it would make life a lot easier if I only had to write 800 words. I need to learn to give myself more time. I also need food. Procrastination is an interesting side effect of college life. I don't think students are told to procrastinate, but rather the fact that they are told not to is why they, is why they me included, do it. Maybe teachers should tell the students to procrastinate. Oddly enough, my closest friends don't procrastinate. Maybe the commonality on, among college students to procrastinate isn't what I look for in my friends. I joined the debate club on campus and I've only been to one meeting thanks to the weather and the cancellations. These people are interesting, opinionated, but righteously so. I think I can be friends with them. What's the commonality between us? Is it because we're all part of the debate club? Can it really be that simple? I have to leave for work again in less than 20 minutes. I still need food. My room is cold. I need to focus on this essay. Do children procrastinate like adults? Of course not. Their parents tell them to do, to do, to get whatever work they need to, whatever work they have to get done now, so they can play later. If procrastination isn't a commonality among children, then why is it easier for them to make friends? What unifies them enough to be able to go to a playground, play with complete strangers, and then call this person their friend? Children have a simple requirement list for their, for who they consider to be their friends. <coughs> be nice to me. Be nice to me, play with me, you're not my friend. Do adults do this too? Adults do make friends the way children do. It's just not, it's just done in very specific situations. I've made friends and still consider these people my friends through my love of cosplaying. If I meet another person who is willing, who is as willing as I am to dress up as a favorite video game or anime character and parade it around in public, then they can be my friend. There is a commonality among children, college students and adults. But these little things that we, as a society, do naturally to a point where it can be safely assumed or even expected of one another doesn't unite us. Adult society would rather look for reasons to judge another person and validate their reasoning for why they didn't befriend someone. As children, these rules are still being taught and established within their own societal structure. College students challenge what they've been taught, and this is why this is what I'm faced with now. With all these rules, society will always give us. A give way to basic human needs and desire when situations become dire or seemingly strange. Cosplaying has allowed me to befriend the strangest people. During Georgia's apocalypse, adults offered help to complete strangers and neighbors that they wouldn't have talked to otherwise. Human nature and society coexist haphazardly. Acceptable soci social standards can make, can make us forget the basic things that should give us reason to befriend each other. Children do this and this is why they can go to the park and call, their, call, their child, call another child their friend after 20 minutes of playing with them. Adults forget and thus don't count the basic things that everyone does naturally. Adults aren't, adults aren't picky as children, they're just more complicated. I have friends and people to miss while I'm, on, while I'm living on campus. That in itself is comforting. I'm not alone, I certainly don't feel that way, but having someone like me to hang out with on the campus would be nice. Not a procrastinator, that would bother me and only encourage my habit, but rather someone as picky as me. I don't want to have friends for the sake of friendship. I won't go down to I won't go down to students that are and yell out. I procrastinate. I know you procrastinate. We all procrastinate because that common habit is too vague to base friend to base a friendship on. My jealousy of my neighbor's friendship stems from the stems from them being able to create a friendship based upon commonality that is meaningful to both of them. I've got it. Cosplay means something to me. I'm going to go down. I'm going to yell at the student center. I like the cosplay. If you know what cosplay is, then come be my friend. Right. <clears throat> on human nature, what we create. On my 20th birthday, my friends and I went to the High Museum of Art. We had gotten the college student discount to see the Andy Warhol exhibit. My best friend had made the event for me. He said most of the things that I couldn't say. The description read, Chelsea bought a new dress for this, so it looked like you belong with her. Um, the dress wasn't really that important. To be honest, I had bought a new dress every week for nearly two months. The moral of that little digression is that teenagers should never be trusted with any amount of money. <laughs> anyway, I wanted to have a dress code because adults have parties with dress codes and we were pretending to be adults, even though the youngest of us had just left being 18 behind. I remember appro approaching the Lichtenstein house, which was set outside the high. I never really understood art, or at least paintings and sculptures. Yes, they were beautiful, and yes, it takes skill, but I've never, but I've never been moved by it. Uh, the Lichtenstein house is this giant optical illusion. Um, from far away, it looks like any other cartoon suburban home, but as you get closer, the fullness of it disappears. Nothing, 
nothing changes but your perspective. If only all visual art had the same impact that, as that optical illusion, because that house blew my mind. Uh, we asked someone to take our photo in front of the house so we could put it on the internet. Then everyone could see that I had a much more cultural day than them. We were creating ourselves. What we protect. Before we could get, uh, before we could get to the space with all of the Andy Warhol stuff, we had to pass through a few uh, rooms filled with large foam-looking sculptures. The one, um, the one we were standing in front of was dark blue. They all looked like giant exploded lima beans. Around all these giant beans uh, were low wire barricades. It really couldn't keep much of anything out. It was more of a suggestion. The wire said, please, if you can help it, don't cross me. Uh, there was a little boy not too far from us. He reminded me of my nephew, who, had made, who was made completely of hands and wonder. I wouldn't take my nephew to a museum, though. All he wanted to do was touch things. Every sign in every part of the museum warned us against touching the art, harming the art, or looking at the art too hard. <laughs> the little boy looked bored at the giant cushions. He looked on the outside the way I felt, confused by it and kind of bored. Uh, he crept towards the little wire, and my friends and I just watched. Then an older woman walked to him and took his hand. The kid looked up at her as though she had a face he had never seen before. His mother, who was only one sculpture away, strode over, picked him up, and gave the woman an intense look. The mother left the room with her child on her hip. The woman was left, left there fighting back a sheepish, a sheepish look. She was probably trying to replace her embarrassment with a look of righteousness. She was the protector of giant velvet lima beans. Uh, we find what is beautiful. Uh, the woman could have been crazy. She looked exactly like I'd expect a French woman to look based on my many hours of watching television. She was a petite, she was petite with blonde hair and kind of messy, but perfect black jeans and a scarf that looked like it could swallow her head whole. She was, she was crying while observing a painting. I'm assuming she's French, but then again, the Louvre was filled with tourists, including me and my student ambassador group. But no one would, would ever mistake us for being French um, in our matching t-shirts and khaki pants. Um, it was practically the tourist uniform. The tour leader um, was taking us towards the Mona Lisa. He told us not to take pictures of the Mona Lisa. Then he would repeat it again in French, as if any of us spoke French. The room where the Mona Lisa was was very crowded. The paintings were surrounded by 12 other unspectacular paintings, so it really stood out. But after a while of being in the back of the crowd, I decided to walk back towards the gift shop. On my way there, I saw her again, beautiful French woman, small and sad and crying in front of an unspectacular painting. I figured it was the painting that had made her cry, though really, there could have been a number of things that could have happened. I didn't know her. She could have been crazy. She could, have just been, she could have just murdered her boyfriend and decided to enjoy her last bits of freedom before the police got her. She could, have, she could have been one of those people who cried at sunsets or commercials about puppies. But it was more romantic to think that there was something so beautiful in that painting that no one else could see that moved her. What we destroy. Sometimes, sometimes I want to fall to my knees and thank every god that has ever been worshipped that I'm not that interesting. My life has, has less scandal than a 1950s sitcom, and it was just as simple. All the problems get resolved in a, re in a reasonable amount of time, and they all seem to play out in black and white. Not everyone has this privilege. There's no nice way to say it, but I love gossip. Gossip is just like reality, reality TV, except all of the characters are, actu are actually my peers, and I get to see them every day. Um, it's, it shouldn't be as entertaining as it is, but it's a strange sort of form of voyeurism. Not too long ago, I heard a quote by Eleanor Ro Roosevelt that went, great minds discuss ideas, average minds discuss events, small minds discuss people. It's really great that she says that. Uh, it's very inspiring, but I can't help but think how limiting it is. What if I want to have a conversation about all three? I mean, there's an entire young adult book series devoted to gossip. Um, actually, there are a lot of fiction outside of Gossip Girl that focus on gossip. They all have the same story, though. The star is a pretty blonde girl, and her brunette sidekick, uh, they run around a small town or a big city, having scandalous lives, and all of their other friends talk about them. 
Um, does this mean that there's an entire generation of young female readers who have small minds? I guess the intention of, of these books is to show how destructive gossip is, um, but they kind of fail. I confess, <laughs> um, I read them, and it wasn't the heartache that gossip caused that kept me reading. It was to find out who had herpes, and who was pregnant, <laughs> and whose baby it was. Outside of the trash literature, when the gossipers were my classmates, uh, real solid people, full-bodied, full-faced, when they take up space on our campus, and it makes me feel guilty. Although it's still crazy entertaining, I have to remember my classmates aren't there for my entertainment. I guess we, I guess we are all ordinary people who have to actively tell ourselves in the morning not to be terrible. What is our nature? We create, we build our world, every part of it, including ourselves. We protect and praise our creations and try to find beauty in every piece of them. Surround them with low wire and signs that ban flash photography. The same care isn't always applied to people who are all their own creations, their own living art, full-faced, full-bodied, taking up space. We protect creations, but we don't always protect each other. Thank you. Next up. Transgenre Dysphoria Blues. I'm listening to an album about a transsexual prostitute written by a trans woman. No matter how out of sorts I feel about my body, about my mind, I will most likely never have the experience of looking in the mirror and seeing something totally incongruous with my conception of myself. When I look in the mirror, I see my mother's son, and that will never trouble me. I do not wish to be my mother's daughter. That feeling of being out of sorts is not alien, however. I know it as being out of sorts with other people other people's conceptions of me versus my conception of myself. The music helps. It tells me that I'm not alone. Laura Jane Grace helped show me how much worse it could be. I sympathize with her pain. In hearing of her pain, I desperately want her life to get better, and in sharing that sympathy, my own life gets better. Sometimes I think I can see all of humanity in music. I see our kindness and our anger, our hatred and our love. It comes in strange, twisting notes and contrasting chords, but it comes nonetheless. Where most other people hear discord and harsh grating noise, I hear the release of pain and the catharsis that comes to fruition with the cadence. I feel it rise in my gut, that thrash unreal that shows me a life I have nothing in common with and yet feel completely connected to. And when I feel like I, and when I feel like I do now, that connection is what I need. The stress of school mixed with the nausea that comes with occasionally forgetting to take my medication, mixed with the lack of a job which leads me to think of the lack of direction in my life. I'm drawn to feel the lows of life, and I go to music to bring me the highs. It's that kind of beautiful contrast that's so important. I think I'm drawn towards contrast in music. In AP Music Theory in high school, when I still thought I wanted to major in music, making my career, we learned that contrast is good. When the treble hand moves up, the bass hand moves down. Go in, op go in opposing directions. It sounds weird when I explain it, but it sounds right when I play it. I think it helps to keep this idea of contrast in mind when listening to heavy, aggressive music. When the vocals on Deaf Heaven's Sunbather grate against my ears in the prototypical way that black metal vocals do, I listen to the guitars behind it. The guitar flows, the octave chords giving a sense of melancholy, a lust to drag my emotion out to blend and complement the lyrics. George Clark screams, I gaze into reflective eyes, I cried against an ocean of light. I understand. I haven't been in that place before, but now I have. By oneself, the experience of life can be so limited. My experience of life is limited by living in Georgia instead of New York, America instead of Asia, being white instead of black. I can covet and collect a myriad of experiences. I study abroad in Oxford. I volunteer at vegetarian cafes. I become the editor of a college literary magazine. I desperately try to get a job at a record store. I do things that other people don't. Perhaps I will eventually do things, create works of art, which no one else but me could create. Ultimately, no matter my experience, my version of human nature is wholly my own. Since I wasn't born in Florida, since I'm not transgender, since I'm not the individual Laura Jane Grace, I cannot inherently know or experience human nature the way Laura Jane Grace does. The same goes for George Clark. The same goes for everybody. I don't think that music can give me the experience of being someone else, but in the way of literature and film, music has the power to, tra power to transport me to another state of mind. In many cases, the state of mind is utterly alien to my own. I can become ethereal, listen to instrumental bands like Explosions in the Sky and This Will Destroy You, these, these artists do something I never could, create pure emotion and sensation with only music. The only words I receive from the musicians come from song titles. I take the title, a throwaway phrase like your hand in mind, 
and the rise and fall of chiming guitars and orchestral drums bring, brings me a story. The story is every love in my present and past. I see myself walking along frozen Atlanta streets in the dark of night. I feel myself lying in bed alone, a high school student aching for the, the love of a dream. I can transcend time and space in a way that other people can only do with drugs and science fiction. Even if I don't believe in it later, the music gives me compassion for those that love me and forgiveness that the, for those who have hurt me. I find community in the melody. There are probably a good amount of people that feel this way about music in general. Connecting with someone over music is an amazing feeling, a kind of instant kinship over something that means so much to both people involved. Most of the time, the people I meet don't share my feelings on music, or they do, but we have disparate palettes and find little common ground for the, in the specific. I have always and will always have friends that make fun of me for the music I listen to, the music I love. However, I turn to that music in the first place as an escape from targeted attacks to get my height and my hair, my weight and my skin tone. I will gladly let music function as my shield against the worst of life. And again, I see the contrast. Music saves me from the worst, yet amplifies and captures the best. Bring me the slow, mournful guitar melodies of nonfiction on those misty days in Oxford where I was homesick and lonely but hopeful and strangely content. The quickening drums and bass accentuate the spoken words that align so well with the music. These words that capture how I feel about life and death. We're all going, but this is not a bad thing. Give me fiction, give me truth. Take away my sorrow, make me feel each loss. Show me defeat, show me rejection. Show me hope, show me reflection. I want it all in three minutes, plus or minus, plus or minus a few. I want to hear when a mother's son died of cancer, when a man went, met his wife, when a husband killed an adulterer, when a man became a woman. I want to hear it all, because on my own, I can only hear so much. And the best thing about these songs, these albums, is that when I need it to be louder, because something about it demands to be heard or to be felt, I can make it louder. I've heard that it's some, I've heard that sometimes important moments in our life slow down. I haven't had that experience. They seem to go by so quickly. Maybe it's because I've always feel comfortable going at a minimum of 220 beats per minute. Thank you. And uh, Paige Oliver. Um, on human nature and the cosmos. My professor tells my class that humanity is improbable. He tells us that the cosmos is much larger than it appears, and that the elements found on Earth comprise a mere fraction of it. Baryonic matter, the parts of the universe we can detect, Things like stars, heavy elements, and free-floating hydrogen and helium atoms only constitute about 5% of reality. The other 95% of the universe is made up of matter and energy that we can't even detect or classify, he says. Not only is our universe particularly large and alien, but also we humans are particularly small and limited, he implies at his next point. There are only 4,600 parts of carbon per million parts of baryonic matter in the Milky Way. Carbon is the building block of life, and it is incredibly rare, even when we only compare it to the other types of matter we can currently detect. Life, my professor concludes, while my class and I struggle to write down the data he has already conveyed, is an irregularity. Earth is a newborn in relation to the oldest parts of our universe and the organisms it supports are, are a mere pixel on the screen of reality. It is only by the remotest chance that humanity exists at all. In short, I think, we are anomalous. We are precarious. We are insignificant. I don't need to write those facts down in my notebook. For me, they constitute not so much a revelation as a refrain. <coughs> I feel like I'm exploding, I told my therapist. I mean, not like exploding, because an explosion happens all at once. Like I'm flying apart, I guess. Not as fast, but with the same force? My therapist looked especially patient, which was how I knew I wasn't making much sense. I pressed on anyhow. But at the same time, I sort of feel like I'm falling, sinking or being pulled down. By anything specific, he asked. Just by myself, I guess. It's all internal. My therapist made a note on his tablet. I couldn't see why. We'd had this conversation dozens of times, maybe hundreds since I first started seeing him. The only thing that changed were the metaphors I used to describe the push-pull of my anxiety and depression. I would not find the perfect analogy to encapsulate the experience until I learned about the mechanics of stars. 
The energy a star puts off results from innumerable continual explosions occurring in its atoms. These explosions fight against the gravity holding the star together, emitting light and heat even as the star is pulled ever inward by its own mass and motion. All stars run out of fuel and die eventually, but if the star is massive enough, it gives one final great explosion before collapsing in on itself. A star gone supernova can take out entire planetary systems, and not even light can escape the black hole it leaves behind. My depression is like gravity. My innumerable anxieties are like nuclear explosions. Together, they create the thing around which the rest of my inner life orbits. I can no more understand where I would be without it than scientists understand the inner workings of a black hole. Still, its essentiality to my selfhood does not change the fact that it is a precarious axis on which I turn. Sooner or later, either an explosion will tear me apart or an implosion will drag me down. My professor tells my class that humanity is imprecise. He tells us that most of the cosmologists who made revolutionary discoveries about the universe did so accidentally or in spite of their own contrary dogmas. None of the so-called fathers of cosmological science actually followed the scientific method. Years of tradition had instilled certain beliefs in Western thought that kept scholars biased in spite of concrete evidence contradicting them. The idea that the planets revolved around the sun was first proposed as early as 270 BC, but no one took it seriously until over a thousand years later. And early scientists were messy. The math Nicholas Copernicus used to prove the Earth orbited the sun was actually incorrect. In short, I think, we are stubborn, we are haphazard, we are repetitive in our mistakes. I don't need to write that down either. You need to let go of these negative ideas about yourself, my therapist told me. I know I do. You've told me before. You've told me all of this before. And it's all just stupid words, and I can't... What's the point of even coming here if we're just saying the same things over and over? My dad keeps asking me whether I'm progressing, and I don't have any improvements to show him. Like, what have I actually learned? I wiped at my eyes, and with no small amount of irony or kindness, he answered, the point of me reiterating my advice is that one day it might possibly sink in. I snorted. It was an ugly sound. It said what I couldn't. That possibility seemed like a pretty feeble reason to keep going at this point. My phone tells me that I am probably too late. It's 4 a.m., and the best opportunity to view the meteor shower passed after 3. Yet having woken up this early despite forgetting to set my alarm, and knowing that I won't be able to go back to sleep, I go outside anyway. My house is a good distance from civilization, but the sky still seems too light for stargazing as I walk out to the field behind my house, dragging a plastic deck chair behind me. I have no idea which direction to face, and so, feeling defeated already, I simply angle my chair toward the most open swatch of sky. An entire semester learning about cosmology has left me with no better understanding of how ancient peoples could discern patterns in the heavens, could, dete could detect changes in them. From where I'm sitting, the stars all seem so random and remote, unknowable and innumerable. Then again, I feel that way about people, too. Minutes pass. The tips of my fingers go numb, and my neck begins to stiffen. The, the sky gets steadily lighter. I feel stupid for bothering to come out here. But as I move to check the time on my phone, a strand of light arcs across the corner of my vision, brief but unmistakable. I jerk my head to look, but the meteor has already disintegrated. It was there, though wasn't it? I won't see any more shooting stars this morning. A single meteor gone in a moment seems like the definition of anticlimax. But somehow I feel a little more at peace. Hey, I tell the part of the sky that held it however briefly. I guess you relate to So I can
can ask you all questions facing you rather than, than sort of over here to the right. I want to ask a couple of questions, get a conversation started, and then turn it over to questions from the audience. Um, in this class, we've talked a lot about a lot of things, but I want to throw out three different ideas and see if anybody wants to respond to them. We've talked about different form for the um, literary essay, the long form essay. We've talked about graded, segmented, permanent crowd essays. And I'm hearing a lot of different forms in these. So I'd like to know if anybody wants to discuss uh, the form they chose and why. Or we've also talked about you know, the large and the narrow, that a literary long form essay is about both the what some people call the thing and the other thing. So I might want you to talk about, you know, what is the intimate versus the large in your essay? Or is there an essay that influenced you? I can hear an influence in pages, but we know what that is. So if anybody wants to speak to either form and their choice of form, large versus narrow, and how they approached it, or if there's a particular uh, literary essay as to influenced you and why. Throwing it out to the group. I mean, a particular essay that influenced me was Virginia Woolf, obviously. Tell me why. Um, her essay, A Street Haunting, um, is about her going out to buy a pencil, and then it kind of changes into this uh, dialogue about the connection between humans and the connection with the rest of the world. Um, and I don't know, I just think there's something very, there's some truth in that. Like the essay, all about, the essay is, is written to get to what the truth is. And I think that Virginia Woolf doesn't know what the truth is. And the truth is obviously more than buying a pencil in her case. Yeah, thank you. Anyone else want to talk about any of this? Alex. Let's say, like, uh, as far as learning, like, figure out how to write this, um, the f like, the prompt was just on human nature and society, and we had a word limit, and that was pretty much it. Um, and when I started, I was thinking, like, a philosopher of what do we define human nature as, and after writing about a page, I'm like, this is terrible. Um, <laughs> and essay writing is a process. Yeah. yeah. Um, and we talked about, like, the large versus the narrow, um, and if the large is human nature and society, but we need the narrow to be something very particular and intimate to us, which is why I wrote about music. Um, so somehow I made it make sense, I think. Good. Um, as far as my influence goes, it was, um, we read in class and in a previous class a doctor, with Professor Handler that I took um, named uh, The Fourth State of Matter, and I cannot for the life of me remember the author. Joanne Beard. Joanne Beard. Yeah. Excuse me. Anyway, um, it was how uh, she... It, the essay itself was about her dealing with the aftermath of a school sh shooting that she'd escaped and um, dealing with a divorce with her husband and um, also on another level with her dog dying. Um, so Sounds so cheerful. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> happy subjects and yet somehow she managed to braid all these three, these three different occurrences, these things that were happening in her life. Uh, with scientific um, uh, concepts and terminology in order to make an ultimately cathartic piece. And that's what I wanted to do uh, in this essay, to use this huge scale, this universal um, just vista of the sky and the stars and the process of discovering them with the comparative process of me trying to um, accept certain emotional uh, problems I was having in my own life. And so, yeah, so that's really where I was going with this. Um, with my essay, uh, it started as a braided essay, but I really struggled up until the point like I turned it in. When I got it back, um, I met with Dr. Handler about it, and she was like, well, you have three elements. It's like you're braiding it, but then just kind of, you just kind of let it go. <laughs> it's just like, yeah. So, um, in. You changed the format, didn't you? Yeah, I changed it um, a, quite a bit into, instead of being a braided, trying to like force all of the elements together, I just kind of let them stand on their own. Um, so, I guess, segmented, turn it into a segmented essay. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, I think for my essay, I really like the idea of a great essay, and I like a segmented essay because it allows me to write about the topic on humane society and throw my own passing initial thoughts. Um, 
I think my essay is a little bit of both graded and segmented, just because I do use three examples, or three um, instances with the children, um, my boyfriend, and just living on campus. And also segmented because I throw my own thoughts on each three topics and then I wrap them all together towards the end. Uh, see, the hardest thing about that, about being a graded segmented essay, well, I think with, when we first wrote Montague, um, Montaigne. Oh, Ma Montaigne, yes, Montaigne was the first essay we read about. And I liked, I liked these essays because they were more like journal entries, but more thoughtful, rather than just writing about his day, writing about his thoughts and what he thought about other things and just everything. I really enjoyed it. Enjoyed his reading. Uh, enjoyed his essays. Um, but I think the hardest thing about that was that how do you turn the journal entry into an essay? And the braided and the segmented um, forms helping with that to create this essay. Thank you. Any last thought? Any mm -hmm. comments about your work or general thoughts? And then I can turn it over to the to the general populace. Anybody want to say anything that you didn't get to? You don't have to. Thank you. Thank you. Another round for <laughs> So what's the procedure? We open it to questions? How does this work? Yes, ma'am. Were you all writing on the same prompts? Like yeah. the yeah. on the nature? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, we took that initial prompt and made it one of our assignments in the class. And then based on what we had read and discussed about essays, literary essays, over time and different formatting or, or structures, these are writers who could do with the prompt and the word count what what they could, what they wanted. So I think it's really interesting that knowing that now that makes sense because now I can hear that and all of them, but I think it's really cool how all of these sound as like completely different perspectives. But now I can tell like, that I'll try Hence the large and the narrow, yeah, the exactly. small subject and the big subject. Cool. Thank you. Anyone else? Should I go out and be an audience member and ask a question? <laughs> okay, here, I'll come out into the audience and ask a question. Reaching for my performance, so. Essentially, what truth is to you, and what your opinion It's basically your opinion on something, but you're also exploring the topic yourself. Like you were learning as you were writing about it, about what you were writing. And um, what was the question? You pretty much answered it. Um, what, what are your thoughts on the exploratory uh, process in writing? Uh, and the original essays? process. It's a constant thing. It's still like I'm still reading this, and like I still need to go over it again. Like it's constantly changing, and the essay is something that I think is just like a very fluid uh, means of expression. So it's always you're always revising it because you're always going to change your opinion. On it. Yeah. I agree because like I remember I think literary essays are hard to write than academic essays because academic es essays you're usually doing research, you're maybe throwing a, com a comment here and there, but it's mostly researching just facts. And the only thing to change about it is possibly where it makes where one paragraph makes more sense, um, grammar errors, punctual things like that. But a literary essay, you're writing down how you feel, and then you might read over it like within two days and go, I don't like that anymore, and completely scrap it. And just imagine that, like you have a week deadline for paper and you're scrapping every other day. <laughs> I think one essay I recently turned in, we had to do hermit crab stuff, and I don't think we know what it can, can oh, a hermit, hermit crab is. Um, yeah, the hardest <laughs> essay you will ever write. <laughs> it essentially, is you're writing an essay in the form of something else. I think we had a few examples of an essay in the form of um, a Craigslist ad. I heard that in class. Another essay in the form of um, recipes, 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 syllabi. and yeah, syllabi. I didn't remember the syllabi. Mm -hmm. I was kind of just a job, uh, job application. Yeah, job application. Yeah. So just imagine you're trying to write an essay. 
in the form of something else, but you don't want to get too hung up on the form where it doesn't look like an essay anymore. It actually looks like a job application. So I remember that essay. I wrote one up in the form of the Ten Commandments, and I think when I got to the Twelfth Commandment, I was just like, okay, this is this is not what I want to be anymore. And so I just took, I just ignored it for like four days. I was like, I never done touch it. And the day before it was due, I was like, oh my god, I have an idea. I'm going to write it in Psalms. And so I wrote the whole thing in Psalms, and it was much better. But the essay was late, and I'm just like, but this is so much better. So I turned in late anyway, and it just got kind of process where with literary essays, you may or may not have an idea or inspiration until the day of the deadline, or you might just be scrapping all week long until you figure out, oh, okay, this is actually how I feel. And I think I'm going to feel this way for about three days until I have to turn in. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, on rewriting, it's so difficult. I remember just walking around and complaining, like, I don't even know what I'm talking about. What am I even talking about? What is <laughs> My roommate's nod. <laughs> and uh, at some point, you just, I think I just had to ask myself the question, well, what are you talking about? How does it relate to the prompt? Is this form working for you? Is, is this working for you? And I figured, like, once I started answering the questions, like, that it kind of came together at the end. Um, I guess uh, with the, with the original writing, like I said, like the first like thing I started writing turned out really terrible. It's because with the with we were talking about also the hermit crab essay and how that was a lot harder. So I feel like for this one, we were we were given our our large topic, uh, human nature and society. Mm -hmm. And when I started writing, I was trying to figure out what that was. And I realized that the problem was that like I'm trying to figure out what the large was immediately without looking at the small. So I. I literally wrote no scratch that scratch everything and then started listening because we also have talked about just like little instances which f form really large essays. Uh, one of the essays that uh, Professor Handler mentioned was John Jeremiah Sullivan, and he'll take really like throwaway lines that just really seem perfect and like bring out so much. For example, he had a line that says, uh, "Night had fallen and the Jews had some discord," um, which sounds ridiculous. And if you haven't read the essay, it means nothing, but it brings out so much more. Um, so I think that's in writing it in the first place, finding those little things are what's important. Um, well, I find that, at least in comparison to an academic essay, um, a personal essay requires you to be more confident and more persistent in your ideas. With uh, um, academic essays, you, you, can re you can rely on a method. Uh, certain format, certain certain process that you go through in order to uh, get what you need out of the material. But with um, with personal essays, it's all about finding the universal in the personal. And so you have to be confident about your personal experiences and the fact that they are relevant on some universal level. And you just have to keep persisting and showing how universal your personal life can be. And that requires a certain amount of confidence and a certain amount of craft in order to show it. But like, like they said, start it out wasn't that good, but you just need to keep going and hit upon that personal kernel of truth that has universal significance. Wow. I think in essence, you have to know yourself to know your essay. Like an academic essay, you can lie. You yeah. can you can you yeah. can pretend to you can support a position. You can find evidence for it, but it doesn't mean you have to believe it. Yeah. When you're writing for a personal essay, you really have to believe what you're writing. Yeah, that's probably basic to academic essay. You can say, you know, pigs fly. Okay, find the information on pigs flying. All right, my thesis is pigs flying. Here's everything that supports it. And when it comes to personal essay, you're like, yeah, I believe pigs fly. You're like, okay, everyone's gonna think I'm crazy. Wait, okay, how, why do I believe this? Why do I think this? And having to go through that to write it down and have it make sense is a lot harder than just writing an academic essay. I feel like academic essays you could BS really easily, and personal essays you can't really BS because you're going to read it and be like, yeah, I don't even believe this anymore. <laughs> wow. Thank you. <laughs> Anything else? More prompting, more prompting. <laughs> Essay Students, English 331-01, Spring 2014. <laughs>